This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Well, uh, I want to start off by thanking you for inviting me. Uh, this is just an incredibly esteemed group of speakers, so I'm really honored to just be a part of the symposium today. So thank you for inviting me. And I'll be speaking with you a little bit today about whether some of these foods and you know, macronutrients we've talked about today have become so processed and potent that some people are becoming addicted to them, whether they're showing signs of you know, food addiction, sugar addiction to these foods. So I'll give you a little bit of a roadmap of where I'll be going with my talk today. Uh, I'll be talking with you about some of the background framework that's really supported this field. It's kind of really been growing recently, and you've heard a, a lot of it today, so I'll just kind of briefly go over that. Then I'll be talking about some new data we have coming out about the role of food addiction and binge eating disorder. Um, next, I'll talk about what foods might be addictive, some of the evidence we have on that. And then um, some information about the potential global impact. And finally, I'll be speaking some about important next steps and implications in this area. So uh, if you take a look at this graph um, on your x-axis, it shows the years from 2000 to 2010. And on the y-axis, you have the number of publications that have been coming out that have been looking at food addiction. And if you look from 2000 to 2005, there's not, nothing much going on. There wasn't a lot of interest in that. But if you look in just the, the past few years, there's really been a lot more attention, a lot more articles coming out looking at the role of addiction in, in an eating process. And so there's been some good reasons for why that's been occurring. Um, the first is some of the animal models that we've heard about today. Uh, Dr. Barrage has been absolutely central in mapping some of the reward circuitry that's shared among drugs of abuse as well as eating-related behavior. And Bart Hobel's lab at Princeton really did some groundbreaking research showing rats that were addicted to sugar or addicted to fat, and that they showed many of the same behavioral changes that we typically associate with addiction. Like if you gave them an opiate agonist, which blocked the opiate receptors, they would go into withdrawal that you would typically expect to see of an animal going in withdrawal from like heroin or opiates. They were cross-sensitized to drugs like amphetamines. They would would binge the, on sugar, it would just grow and grow the amount that they would binge on. And they'd be more motivated to consume other addictive substances like alcohol. And then, you know, Eric was a, a great precursor for me. You know, there's a lot of similarities between obesity and substance dependence. Both some of those neural responses that Eric talked about, but also some behavioral indicators that you can think of as shared, like continued use despite negative consequences. You may know that your health is at risk because you're smoking nicotine but be unable to stop, and you see a similar pattern when it comes to overconsuming highly caloric, highly palatable foods. So one question we've posed to ourselves is, does obesity equal food addiction? Are all people who are obese addicted to food? And we think you know, understanding obesity and, and the similarities between that and addiction is really important. But if we really want to test whether certain people are addicted to food, we feel like another layer of precision could be warranted. <laughs> The first is there's some over problems with over-relying on obesity. And some of those have to do with over-identifying people that might be addicted to food. So this is a multifaceted disorder, a kind of medical endpoint. And so some people get there maybe over kind of like chronic mild overconsumption. Some may have issues with physical activity or hormonal issues that we've heard about today. So they may not be showing signs of addiction in their eating per se. There's also the, the fact that use doesn't always equal dependence. So use, even heavy use, doesn't necessarily mean you're addicted to something. So if you think of something like alcohol, 40% uh, or so of college students binge drink alcohol, but less than 10% actually meet the diagnostic criteria for alcohol dependence. So even if someone's over consuming food and that's causing their obesity, that wouldn't necessarily be indicative of being addicted to food. And there's also the role of compensatory behaviors, and that might result in under-identification of individuals who may be showing signs of addiction in their eating behavior. 
unlike other substances, you know, you can't go out, drink a bunch of alcohol, and then somehow do something that's going to reduce its impact on your liver. You can't, you know, go on a jog and then your liver is going to be fine. But when it comes to your body mass index, there's lots of ways to potentially moderate that. Periods of restriction, overexercise. So you may be seeing signs of addiction type behaviors in the eating, but it wouldn't necessarily show up in the body mass index. And addiction is defined by a set of behavioral diagnostic criteria. And so as the field, we already have this standard for what we think addiction looks like. So seeing whether these kind of hallmarks are also present in eating behavior is an important step to really examining the validity of the food addiction concept. So just as a brief review, here are the diagnostic criteria for substance dependence. You need to have substance use leading to three or more of the following symptoms in a 12-month period of time, and you also need to be experiencing clinically significant impairment or distress. So there's tolerance. You consume more and more of the substance to get the effect you want. Withdrawal, when you try and cut down or stop, you show either psychological or physiological symptoms. You take more of the substance than you intended. You have a persistent desire or effort to cut down that's unsuccessful. You spend a great deal of time acquiring, using, or recovering from the effects of the substance. And important activities are given up because of use. And there's continued use despite persistent problems. So if you meet three or more of these in a 12-month period and associated with use from alcohol or nicotine, you would be given di a diagnosis of substance dependence. And so we created the Yale Food Addiction Scale to really operationalize addictive eating behavior. And we wanted to do this based on this agreed upon diagnostic criteria for substance dependence. And we took this criteria and we translated it to eating related behavior. So our preliminary validation of the Yale Food Addiction Scale was done in a non-clinical college age sample, but we found the psychometric properties promising. We found evidence of adequate reliability as well as convergent and incremental validity in predicting binge eating. So this suggested to us that we were you know, kind of adding a little something to the eating related field. But this also left a lot of questions about the clinical utility of this measure. So would the Yale Food Addiction Scale still be sound in a measure with people who are receiving a diagnosis of a clinical eating-related problem? Also, would it be useful in understanding this problem? Would it be associated with a more uh, extreme path, more difficulty with eating-related behaviors? Or could it potentially predict treatment outcome, a greater tendency to drop out or respond to treatment? And then one of the important theoretical questions is the overlap between binge eating disorder and food addiction. You know, binge eating has attributes of it that are typically associated with substance dependence, like a loss of control over consumption, not being able to cut down, continued use despite negative consequences. So by us coming in and doing this food addiction concept, we just taking, you know, binge eating disorder and you know, marketing it a slightly different way. So we wanted to make sure we were adding something to the field, not just renaming something that's already existed. So to do this, we looked at the Yale Food Addiction Scale in a clinical sample. Uh, there were 81 obese treatment-seeking binge eating disorder patients, and they were administered a battery of disordered eating scales, general psychopathology measures, and the Yale Food Addiction Scale. They were also given a full diagnostic interview for psychopathology, as well as an eating disorder examination interview. The age of this sample was much older than our um, original college age sample, the mean age being 47 years of age. And 70.1% were female. This is pretty reflective of the rates you typically see in binge eating disorder. And the mean body mass index of this group was 40.58, so they were really being placed in a severe obesity range. So 57% of these participants met the food addiction diagnostic cutoff. And the people who did meet the food addiction diagnosis had, were, had a higher lifetime prevalence of major depressive disorder. And they were also more likely to have higher scores on the Beck Depression Inventory, Dysfunctional Emotion Regulation Scale, and the Eating Disorder Examination. And one thing we found really interesting is that although they had higher eating disorder scales overall, they didn't show a, a relationship with restraint. And that's interesting for a couple of reasons. The first is, in some ways, we don't really know what restraint measures. Eric's done some really good work showing that restraint doesn't really measure necessarily dietary intake. 
But restraint and high scores on restraint scales have been really central to eating disorder hypotheses. Uh, the idea is that you know, binge eating is sort of caused because you have very strict, restrictive dietary rules, and then when they're violated, you binge eat. So the fact that this group wasn't showing elevated restraint we thought was you know, pretty interesting. And we also found that it was significantly negatively correlated with the Rosenberg self-esteem scale. So higher food addiction scores, lower self-esteem. But I think one of the most interesting findings that we had was looking at the incremental validity of binge eating. So we were curious, does the food addiction scale provide us with any more knowledge than the measures that already exist out there? Um, so we specifically in this analysis predicted the frequency of binge eating in this group. And we did this through a hierarchical regression model. And in the first part of the model, we included the Beck Depression Inventory and the Global Eating Disorder Examination. And the reason we did that is that these are really kind of gold standards for an association with binge eating disorders. So we really wanted to pit our scale against really tried and true measures of binge eating. And what we found was that neither eating disorder, the eating disorder examination or the Beck Depression Inventory significantly predicted the frequency of binge eating. They're associated with a binge eating diagnosis, but they didn't appear to predict its severity. In contrast, after in block two, we included the Yale Food Addiction Scale, and we found that it was a significant predictor of the frequency of binge eating, accounting for 6.3% of the variance. So as a review of what we found in this study, we found that food addiction was related to binge eating disorder, but it did not totally overlap, which suggests that you know, this isn't just the exact same concept conceptualized slightly differently. The next was that the, you know, we think this might be potentially related to subtypes of binge eating disorder that are already existent in the field. And again, Eric's done work on that. Um, one of the subtypes of binge eating disorder that's been identified is a group that appears to be kind of very associated with dietary restraint that I mentioned earlier. But there seems to be a more severe subtype that struggles more with impulsivity, negative affect, and kind of overall more disturbed variant of binge eating disorder. And our question is, our findings really kind of map nicely onto the secondary subtype. And a question is, is this group potentially also struggling with an addiction to the highly palatable, high sugar, high fat foods that they're consuming? Is that adding to the difficulty in their binge eating behavior? And again, our, our measure was the only measure to significantly account for the frequency of binge eating. And we think this is really important because frequency of binge eating is predictive of treatment outcome. So we think this does suggest that this measure has some clinical utility. But there's still some important future questions to consider. So this was a sample of only obese binge eating disorder patients. We think it'll be really important to have a group of binge eating and non-binge eating participants to see, does our scale pick up on eating pathology that isn't typically measured by the traditional eating disorder diagnoses? Does it add anything to our understanding of eating pathology as a whole? and then predictive utility. So we'll be following these participants over time, and we'll be curious about whether food addiction scores predict their treatment outcome. So I want to you know, kind of shift topics here a little bit, and I want to think about addictive foods. So most of the research up to this point has really asked whether certain people are addicted to food. I think that's really important, especially for people that self-identify, who, who feel that they're addicted to food. There hasn't been a lot of um, kind of respect for that, that perspective, it's often you know, considered to be false. Um, so I think understanding whether or not people are addicted to food can help them get treatment that really reflects what they're struggling with. But I also think it's important to think about whether certain foods are capable of triggering an addictive process. And one of the reasons I think this is really important is because Addictive substances have a widespread impact, not just in clinical disorders, but as well as kind of widespread public health concerns. So I'll use the example of alcohol. Um, so about 90% of people consume alcohol over their lifetime, but between 5 to 10% receive a lifetime diagnosis of alcohol dependence. Given that, it's the third leading cause of preventable death in the United States. And much of this impact is due to people with subclinical issues with alcohol, but it causes enough widespread damage that it has a massive public health cost. So even if people aren't showing the full diagnostic criteria of food addiction, it may have such widespread environmental cost that it, it could really be a potential target. And essentially, and also understanding what foods, if any, are capable of triggering an addictive process will be essential for making treatment and policy recommendations.
So I'll provide you with a little bit of data that we have so far looking at what people report are the foods that they feel that they sh show the most addictive symptoms to. And people fill this out after they filled out the Yale Food Addiction Scale. And the Yale Food Addiction Scale doesn't say addiction anywhere on it. We don't, you know, we just have the symptoms. So it, it's not priming so much those, those biases that people have initially. And what you see here on the x-axis are, are different foods. And on the y-axis are the percent of participants who are endorsing that they experience addictive life eating with that. And so you see this high fat, high sugar foods that we've really been talking about for much of this conference have really high endorsement rates, much higher than just the, the clinical diagnostic syndrome, which in this sample was about 10%. So people seem to be experiencing that. And just to contrast this a bit, you know, crackers and pretzels, foods with you know, lower palatability, lower calorie, lower fat, lower sugar, just aren't getting the same levels of addictive type endorsement. So you know, while much more work needs to be done on this, coupled with biological measures and behavioral measures, we think this potentially provides a, a sample of, of where to go, what foods to look at. So, I also want to really bring attention to the idea of the global impact of potentially addictive foods. You know, we have tobacco as a case study before us. You know, tobacco, as it became more, uh, there was a greater understanding in the U.S. and the U.K. and other European countries of the, the health impacts and the addictive nature of tobacco, the food companies began to export their, their marketing and their substances to developing nations. So while tobacco use has gone down in the U.S. and the U.K., tobacco use has gone up in countries like India and China. So the global impact of this substance is, is still really, really concerning. And so food is, is kind of following a similar pattern. Uh, we're you know, kind of exporting this westernized diet across the world. And also as some of the concern about the potentially addictive health impacts of certain ingredients are becoming more well known in the US, they're being exported elsewhere. Like foods containing high fructose corn syrup kind of being taken more out of the western market and putting more in developing nations. And so we wanted to study this a little more tightly to see what this correlation may be between you know, over excessive consumption of food and something like McDonald's. You know, of course, McDonald's isn't the only you know, food that, that's a problem, but we think it's kind of this hallmark of the Western diet being exported. And here we're looking at the correlation between the number of McDonald's and France and the obesity rates in France. So what I'm showing you right now are the obesity rates in France from 1981 to about the mid-90s. And you know, we've often thought of France as this country that's kind of been immune to the impact of the global food environment. They've kind of been able to maintain their, their own food diet. And this happened for a lot of reasons. There were some lawsuits against McDonald's, there were protests and vandalism, kind of trying to keep McDonald's out. And the number of McDonald's relative to other countries didn't grow as quickly, and their obesity rates stayed relatively stable. But McDonald's won out, and now France has one of the highest amount of McDonald's per capita in all of Europe. And you'll see that their obesity rates are catching up with the rest of us. So again, this question is, you know, when thinking about the impact of potentially addictive foods, I think it's important to not just take uh, you know, kind of a, a home-based view, but policy and treatment and prevention is going to need to take a global perspective. So some other important future directions for this food addiction research area is physiological markers. So uh, Eric Stice's group and, and my group at Yale have a paper coming out that I wasn't allowed to talk to you about in detail today because of journal restrictive guidelines. Uh, and it comes out April 4th in Archives of General Psychiatry, and it's looking at the neural correlates of food addiction. I think it speaks a little bit to some of what we've seen today. Uh, the participants showing the most symptoms of food addiction while controlling for body mass index showed a lot of reward-related neural response, specifically to cues that really mirror a lot of the effects that we expect to typically see with somebody who has a substance dependence to alcohol or nicotine. And and interestingly enough, when we looked at differences during consumption of a milkshake, we found very few differences between our high and low food addiction group, but rather saw some brain responsivity that suggests disinhibition. So it, it's a starting point, so you know, keep your eye out for that paper when it comes out. And I think one of the most interesting areas is some of 
which has been touched on today is the idea of food addiction in children. So unlike other addictive substances that would typically be consumed maybe you know early adolescence, early adulthood, food's something that you're exposed to from a very, very early age. And right now there's so many food choices that vary in their nutritional content, content as well as their palatability. And we know that the first age of use and how early that is is a major predictor of the development of substance dependence to things like alcohol or nicotine. The brain is more vulnerable, it starts to become kind of a a psychological coping tool and others don't develop. Our question is whether the same thing may be happening with food but at a much earlier age. And so that's an important area of future study. So just to kind of sum up, my, my main point here is that looking at the, the public health implications of this is going to be really important. And so a substance-focused approach in the substance dependence field before has been really important. Again, looking to tobacco, we did a great job developing more effective treatments, both psychological and pharmacological, for tobacco. But when you really started to see a drop in the rates of tobacco in the US was when we started to focus on the environment surrounding tobacco and access to tobacco. And so you know, kind of hearkening back to that, question about vending machines that we talked about earlier, you know, when you look back at tobacco, you know, I can remember having tobacco vending machines in bowling alleys and restaurants and movie theaters. And as some of the approaches to dealing with tobacco started focusing more on the tobacco environment, many, many states have now passed laws restricting vending machine access to tobacco. So, you know, some of the successes in this field may speak to potentially successful policy implications for dealing with the obesity epidemic. And as we've talked about today too, you know, the role of cues is especially important. So I always like to think about you know, thinking on just your way here today. And if you stop and got gas or you drove past billboards, you turned on the TV, think of the amount of floods of advertisements and food cues that you saw today. Just imagine in a moment, like just shifting those in your head to thinking of those were all alcohol cues, and you were somebody who was struggling to control your alcohol use. That's a, it's going to be a really, really difficult challenge. And so that you know, the role of cues potentially dealing with the cues in our environment may be especially important area to look at in the future. So I want to thank you all for you know, being such a good audience today, and I want to. <laughs>
Very good point. And in this initial study, we um, assessed it through a impulsivity measurement scale. That's part of the dysfunctional um, emotion regulation scale. But some areas that we're looking into are uh, like um, there's cue go, no go tasks that sort of show a general Im issue with impulsivity. There's also in children these delayed gratification tasks, which I think might speak to it a little bit there. Uh, so I think behavioral measures would be especially important. And I think you're really tapping into one of the important areas to look for treatment. You know, with if you already have this strong drive, this strong wanting for this food and on top of that your ability to kind of control your impulses is taken offline you're going to struggle so you know there's some certain cognitive behavioral techniques that have been suggested to sort of strengthen your ability to have like a top down clamping down on these wanting behaviors so i think it's it's a really good target for future intervention oh, sorry. Um, i couldn't help notice that the two most addictive foods were mm -hmm. ice cream and chocolate and they both are known for phase transitions. And when you put them in your mouth, they're a different ah, thing than when they yeah. respond to the warmth of your mouth. And it might be that what makes certain foods more addictive is getting around the mm. specific set type. So if you eat the same food like gummy bears, if that's yeah. a change phase, you get sick of it quicker than food. It's interesting. That's a really good idea. And you know, just kind of thinking again about, you know, kind of how we ingest food and how that may be important. You know, thinking of cues again, you know, some of the cues are, are inherent to the food. So if you get that really lovely mouthfeel where it melts and covers your whole mouth, you've got more cues to deal with there. On top of that, you know, David Kessler's book and uh, The End of Overeating kind of talks a lot about you know, that foods are being stripped and stripped and processed to a point now where they're quicker and easier to eat. And so when you think of what increases the addictive potential of a substance, it's quicker, you know, potent ingestion. The, the faster the speed of absorption of the potent substance, the more likely it is to be addictive. And so if you have something like that melts in your mouth, I mean, you don't have to chew it, and it's just, you can really just eat a bunch of it really, really quick, that may be also increasing addictive potential through a mechanistic way. So thank you. <laughs>